appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this conversation. I also want to thank Dean Galea for the invitation as well. Um, what uh, I want to do is take a few minutes to talk about through some slides both the work we do, the importance of the work uh, in the current epidemic, as well as uh, looking forward of where we all can partner to make an impact. So um, we can get the slides. Appreciate it. Great. So uh, if the next slide, basically, we can move to. Um, it, it, if you see the challenge over the last several years, this is a slide um, that demonstrates from 1999 to the most recent data. Uh, you can clearly see on your left-hand side that um, the synthetic drugs like fentanyl have been largely responsible for the overdose deaths uh, in the United States. On the right-hand side, Equally important is the fact that if you look at the age groups, it's those between 25 and 49 uh, years old that are uh, bearing the brunt. Why is that important? Well, because first of all, that's the workforce uh, in this country at a time when uh, we have some of the lowest birth rates ever on record in this country, um, and, and a lot of economy uh, that losses happen up to the tune of about $1.5 trillion dollars a year. That's with a T, trillion. Next slide, please. And one of the things we've done is um, in this office is to work with our Department of Transportation colleagues to put together a near real-time data dashboard. But this data comes from all the 911 calls uh, at a very much a zip code and a county level uh, for opioid overdoses. Uh, this can be a really important uh, policy, but also a first responder action tool and a research tool uh, that allows us to look at this from a demographic standpoint, from a response standpoint, as well as where the resources need to go. Um, you know, very similar to the pandemic, uh, this allows us to look at opioid overdoses right now in near real time, as I said, with almost a, about a two-week lag. But we're working very quickly and soon to put other overdose uh, circumstances, non-opioid, as well on there. So um, this is going to be really important to have a near real-time or real-time assessment, one that has not existed for the last uh, few decades. Next slide, please. And then when we talk about expanding treatment, it's critical because uh, what is uh, not surprising, I guess, but really critical is of the 8 million people that suffer from opioid use disorder, of the 46 million people with substance use disorder, um, hardly about 288,000 are actually receiving MOUD. So what that means is if you look at the total percentages of people, as I said, 8 million, it's a fraction of people who are actually getting the treatment. And this analysis uh, is and was important for us to highlight because we must know where and how much we need to move forward in this area. Next slide, please. So if you look at Massachusetts, uh, you know, about 2,500 uh, or 2,600 drug overdose happened in 2021, which is up from uh, significant double digits. And a large percentage of those involve fentanyl, um, and uh, obviously a third almost involve psychostimulants. Xylazine, which is an uh, animal sedative, uh, is increase about 103%, 100% in, in only a year in terms of being found in deaths. Next slide, please. And so uh, th this is kind of the statements of the problem so far. How do you address this comprehensively? Uh, one of the ways we do it is uh, Congress created this office. I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. Uh, primary job is to create a national drug control strategy, which becomes the president's drug control strategy, and then implement it with the budget. Um, when we put this out, um, uh, you know, uh, in this administration, we saw the two biggest drivers of the epidemic, one being untreated addiction, the second being drug trafficking and its profits. Next slide, please. And um, the office, of course, uh, as I mentioned, it does not only the uh, strategy, but has the $44 billion uh, that is split across 
uh, and managing that budget across 19 agencies, which you'll see on the next slide. So these agencies, uh, next slide, please. Uh, you'll see that they range anywhere from Department of Health and Human Services to Homeland Security to Department of Defense, Department of Justice, Postal Services. So it's a wide range from demand to supply side, um, including education. Next slide, please. So when we look at addressing driver number one, which is untreated addiction, it becomes important to make sure that OUD treatment is more widely available. One of the things we've done is to uh, uh, sort of move forward the telehealth component of this. So more people in marginalized communities, rural areas, and incarcerated settings are able to get the treatment. Uh, second is to make sure we understand that of the 2 million people in, in custody any given day in America, two-thirds of them are there because they have an SUD oftentimes, but that doesn't get treated. As a result, we see a lot more overdose fatality post-release, and we also see then a lot of reincarceration because of untreated SUD. So it becomes really important to make sure we, uh, we're working right now to expand access to treatment in prisons and jails across the country. We have states who are applying for 1115 waiver, which that means is allowing Medicaid to turn the switch on 90 days before release from custody so that these folks can be treated. And uh, it has been demonstrated to have produced significantly improved results when that occurs. Next slide, please. And then one of the problems has been, historically, we've had this issue of not only having a DEA license to treat, but also then having an X waiver. And late last year, Congress passed on uh, urging of the president uh, bill uh, to uh, change the law in a way that from 122,000, 128,000 prescribers who had X waiver, like myself, now we have almost 2 million prescribers who have DEA license, who can now prescribe OUD treatment. It's a big um, policy step forward, a historic one, and one that will allow us to have so much more workforce uh, included in here to treat. Next step, uh, slide, please. And then uh, along with OUD comes the life-saving drugs like naloxone. Uh, one of the things is that we know that um, while we distributed about 9 million doses of naloxone last year, well, we had about a half a million uh, life-saving uh, uh, episodes where they were used. Now, naloxone, we worked really hard to make it over-the-counter available uh, in most pharmacies. It's important because it helps. Um, you know, naloxone is a drug that's not only a, a reversal drug for opioid overdose, but it's one that has um, been found largely to be safe and effective, uh, and there's a, a significant amount of uh, resources from federal government flowing through where this can be purchased at almost no cost or no cost to the person. Uh, we're working to make sure we believe that we had additional naloxone doses to the tune of about 7 million. We will be able to save additional 26,500 lives. Um, so the whole idea here is for us to push, uh, uh, make sure that naloxone is available just like a fire extinguisher or an AED device. Uh, we want to see it in schools, we want to see it in camp college campuses, we want to see it in malls and other public areas. Next slide, please. And then one of the best strategies is preventing use before it begins. Uh, we have a program called Drug-Free Communities Support Program that has covers about 67 Americans across the country. It's an evidence-based program, multifaceted, that has in a primary prevention field shown to uh, delay or prevent drug use. Um, we're working with Federal Department of Education to provide messaging to K-12 through school systems and then providing resources for education, educators. Uh, prevention is really an important key. Next slide, please. And then about over 23 million Americans today are in recovery. And if we're successful with the 46 million people in, um, with substance use disorder, we will have more Americans in recovery. So it becomes critical that businesses look at this and we start to build recovery-ready nation through developing recovery-ready workforce and recovery-ready workplaces. Um, recently, we did a press event with Governor Sununu from New Hampshire and the Chief Medical Officer of Google. Uh, Google uh, has now become a recovery-friendly workplace. 
Uh, we have a number of people in recovery in my office and in the White House at large. Um, uh, again, it is uh, really important that we uh, also try to move from treatment to recovery because recovery is a lot more than treatment. It's about all of those wraparound services like housing, uh, like food security, transportation, uh, economic opportunities, education, uh, that help people not just survive but thrive into long-term recovery. Really important piece that we're leading uh, the work here. Next, please. Next slide. And then, um, as I mentioned, that we've got to make sure that we are investing into advancing um, addiction medicine in terms of not only what we have, but more research and development, but then looking at other ways, whether it's methadone or others, how do we find ways to expand treatment? Next slide, please. And now I'll talk about a little bit about the second driver, just a bit, which is the uh, drug trafficking piece. You can see pictures of um, tunnel, drug tunnels, we can see the border uh, uh, with the president there. We can see the meetings with the Mexico delegation and a uh, number of aspects. This becomes important as well uh, because the efforts here uh, allow us to create the space for public health efforts to take root. Uh, so we're working closely to ensure that uh, this non-intrusive inspection technology exists on the border. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that there's appropriate mechanisms in global supply chain with China and Mexico who are partnering with na nations and really making them understand the threat of global, uh, to global threat of synthetics, uh, which is not one that's limited to the United States any longer, unfortunately. Next slide, please. And we've also then put out, actually, we've declassified this picture, which is the entire supply chain of fentanyl, and we're sharing this with foreign governments. Uh, policymakers and others to understand that we need to work in a very coordinated, evidence-based, data-driven me mechanism in order to disrupt the commerce of drug trafficking as opposed to uh, putting and incarcerating individuals for their drug use. So this is a shift that's happening in policy after almost 50 to 60 years in the United States, which is shifting to ensuring that on the supply side, we're going after the very commerce the lifeline, the blood that feeds the trade, but at the same time making sure that people who are suffering from SUD are getting the help they need in lieu of incarceration. Next slide, please. And then uh, drugs like xylosine, understand that it's, uh, in some ways, it's a uh, uh, whack-a-mole, uh, but we still have to ensure that we're taking actions. Uh, so we've announced earlier this year to have xylosine be designated as an emerging threat that allows more resources to flow through to communities, as well as ensuring we're taking every action before this becomes a further threat. Next slide, please. And then what we've done is, when I was the state health commissioner, uh, we had to literally reinvent the wheel every time we wanted to think about how do we help people. Um, one of the great things about uh, you know, the, uh, the office is we're now able to provide state model acts, literally a uh, frame of how do you create overdose fatality review teams? How do you treat substance use in correctional settings? How do you help people, pregnant uh, people and family care plans with SUD? So all student service uh, programs expansion. So we're using the best evidence and the experts to create these uh, model state acts and demonstrating and sharing those with state legislatures and policymakers in states to help them make the best evidence-driven decisions. Next slide, please. And one of the things that you'll find that we're really concerned about in moving forward is the workforce challenge. Um, if you just look at the behavioral health workforce, I've circled some of these. Uh, we are looking at, in the next five years, 12,000-plus shortages in adult psychiatrists, similarly with addiction counselors. So, uh, you know, it's really important that we think about a uh, cascade of care. We think about curricula in not only medical schools, but schools, all, all of the health-affiliated schools. So uh, there's an interest in um, uh, having a workforce of the future that in behavioral health and that is able to actually address and help take care of the people, um, which is quite a number, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. And then during the pandemic, we've had, um, obviously, the burnout for physicians and providers has been a big issue. Um, Congress passed and President signed into law 
Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, which provides resources to uh, in training uh, for healthcare professionals, suicide prevention, as well as be, uh, you know ensuring that we're breaking the stigma when it comes to uh, addiction and substance use disorder and mental health. Next slide, please. I put this slide out there um, in, in, in almost a conclusion because it's important to also note that almost $400 million are being, um, uh, you know, uh, going to the state of Massachusetts. And the idea here is for the Commonwealth to think about and look at how best programs uh, get implemented. And of course, I know uh, the university and the school have a, a, a big equity in that. Thank you. Next slide, please. And I'll just say this, uh, this is the second last slide, that uh, our priorities for the next year coming up is first, uh, you know, it's almost like triage. We have so many people dying. We, if there are big items, we believe that the two of the biggest items is to expand the use of naloxone or Narcan or overdose reversal drugs. And if we do, uh, we've done the analysis here, if we uh, expand to six, seven million additional doses, we'll be able to save 26,000 plus lives. Similarly, if every correctional facility had access to treatment behind walls, we'll be able to save additional nearly 20,000 lives. And then we have to pursue full commercial disruption efforts and aggressively drive forward on prevention, treatment, recovery, and multilateral engagements. The last slide here, next slide please. Well, it's the second to last, I'm sorry. Uh, is, is basically shows that if we do this, what we will start to see is a significant decline in Americans' lives lost. Next slide, please. And what we can all do, what you can do to end this uh, crisis is very similar, as I've said. Carry no oxo. Share the real deal on fentanyl.com resources on college campuses. They talk about two things, the dangers of fentanyl and the importance of carrying naloxone. And thinking about curricula on substance use disorder as we, in long-term, develop policies that continue to be based on evidence and data. With that, I'll end. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Dean Galea. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you for uh, that presentation. Um, uh, so just for everybody in the audience, I'm going to ask Dr. Gupta about 10, 15 minutes of questions, and then we have some questions in the Q&A, which I'll turn to after that. So Dr. Gupta, um, let me start with a softball, easy question. Can you just tell us a little bit about you, about your path, how, how you came to be doing what you're doing? Well, thank you, Dean. Uh, of course, uh, I am uh, only uh, the first physician, but also someone who is an uh, immigrant. Uh, I uh, studied medicine in, in New Delhi in India, and I've actually trained in Chicago. Uh, I spent a, quite a bit of time uh, understanding uh, from a master's of public health as well as business administration. Uh, and, and the issue has been for me is how do you have the greatest impact? Um, as a physician leader. Uh, of course, uh, I have a lot of love for the practice of medicine, uh, but my love is even greater for figuring out how to have a, the largest impact on population health. And that's how uh, my career has uh, sort of taken uh, the, the track, is to always looking at where are the biggest impacts. And at a time when we have an American dying every five minutes around the clock, 110,000 per year, which is only the tip of the iceberg of people who suffer. Um, this has been my passion. Thank you. Let me, um, let me build on something you just said. Let's talk a little bit about um, the administration's, let's call it public health approach to substance use and substance use disorders. You know, you mentioned in your presentation the removal of the X waiver and all that, um, um, and the access to naloxone. So can you guide us through where did the public health approach come in into this administration. It's certainly, obviously, it's uh, much stronger than it was in the previous administration, but it was actually stronger than it's been in many administrations before that. How did that come about? Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we, on the 35th anniversary of the inception of this office, brought together all of the former directors, uh, all the way from the Nixon era. Mm -hmm. And when they all sat down on a stage you could tell the evolution of the office because we had everybody from a four-star military general to a police chief to a person um, who had spent a life in being a leader in recovery. Um, and I think it's an evolution that not only has uh, 
here in this administration, but our country has gone through, which where now we recognize that this is a public health crisis first and foremost. Um, to address the public health crisis, we must take an evidence-based public health approach that includes harm reduction for the first time in the history of the United States government. We have three elements in naloxone, syringe service programs, as well as drug checking as part of that harm reduction, but also expanding uh, treatment and recovery as well as prevention. So this public health approach is unique uh, in this administration because it really signals the change in the direction of the policy this office and previous administrations have had in a way that um, is, is hopefully going to be long lasting and hopefully also going to be impacting people's health and survival in a way it hasn't been in the past. Yeah, so it's interesting that you, you, you comment, which I agree with that um, this administration in some respects is actually where the growing understanding in the general public is in, in terms of uh, approaches to substance use disorders. But let me build on that and ask perhaps a harder question. So let's talk a little bit about the tension between harm reduction approaches and abstinence-based approaches, which as you, I think, correctly note, in the history of ONDCP, we've seen it in a, sort of a, in, in just in the persons of the directors, let alone, of course, in the philosophies. And my read of your work is you've navigated that line. You've sort of uh, you, you've you've had to deal with the different philosophies behind harm reduction and abstinence-based approaches. Can you comment a little bit about where you think that tension is at today, and how we how, how we consider harm reduction, abstinence-based approaches, trying to take the best of both to create the healthiest possible population? That's a great question, Dave. Thank you for that. Um, you know, when I went to medical school. Uh, we didn't know anything literally about addiction. Um, we uh, did not understand the various chemistry that occurs in our brain. We didn't understand that it was a brain disease. It was often labeled as more moral failing. Uh, today, when my son is in medical school, it's a very different understanding. Um, and it's, it's, it's an, uh, we must adapt to the learning of science and evolution that occurs as human beings. Uh, what we try to, what I try to accomplish and uh, sort of talk about is the science side of this, which is, um, on one hand, um, we have to treat this as no different than a disease like diabetes and hypertension. That's the first aspect of this. The second, harm reduction approach is important because this is about triage uh, in, in some ways, which is we have to meet people where they are and then help them get through to the next level. Uh, harm reduction is not, uh, it's not unique to addiction medicine. It is not unique to medicine or public health. If you think about, uh, even today, we have a, a COP28 summit happening in Dubai. If you think about it, what people are often talking about, you can also term it as harm reduction uh, because people are talking about alternatives to fossil fuels. That's literally harm reduction. So the idea and the notion of harm reduction is about saving lives first and foremost, meeting people where they are, understanding people, and then helping them move to the next level. Um, that is important because if we take an approach which is we know best, this is a moral failing, then it gets us in a very dark area where we have been. And we tell other countries now to not go there because we've had this uh, negative experience over decades where we've lost more people than we should have. And it has obviously impacted communities of color and marginalized populations a lot more than the rest of us. Let me ask a question from the audience because it ties into this before I go back to my questions. Uh, this question from Dr. Steve Jones about the pending legislation to allow addiction specialist physicians to prescribe methadone um, to treat opioid use disorders without requiring physicians be part of the opioid treatment program and to allow pharmacists to dispense methadone to treat OUD. Can you just, can you comment on that? Yeah, so I'll comment in a limited way, uh, and there's reasons for that. Uh, uh, look, uh, I showed the data. Um, less than a million people overall are getting treatment when 8 million people are suffering from OUD, opioid use disorder. Um, the OTPs today that exist uh, largely treat about a half a million people, give and take. Um, we have an approach, we could take two approaches. One, we could say, well, we want to build an OTP in every nook and cranny across this country and get on that on a 100-year plan. Or we could say, well, the idea here is to help people get treatment when and where they need it, as opposed to 
a particular special interest. Uh, when we take that approach, then we have to start to look at all the tools and the best science available to us, turn that into good policy, and then move forward. Uh, so we're looking at those things. We're looking very carefully at um, does methadone need to be treated in the same way it has been treated for the last 30, 40 years, uh, especially at a time when people, as I showed the data, are dying from fentanyl, which... Uh, some people may benefit from buprenorphine. Others might actually need methadone, that the pure agonist, uh, to be helpful. Uh, so it's really important that we let the science and the data guide policymaking. Let me, um, thank you. Let me ask about data. Let me just do a bit of a deep dive on the data question. And um, can you just talk a little bit about progress we're making on data? You know, off the top of my head, the CDC monthly provisional numbers have been good. They've been a big improvement. but um, there obviously remains a lot more to be done, and you hinted at that in your presentation. Can you just talk a little bit about your assessment of where we're at on the state of data and perhaps also give us some thoughts about how we can get better, assuming that we can get better, which I think we can agree on easily? That's a really good question, and here's what my thoughts are. When pandemic came, uh, you could look at your phone and tell how many cases in your county were yesterday of, of uh, COVID. Today, we still are not able to do that 20 years and 1 million lives lost later. So that was our challenge. And that's why when I showed the data dashboard, we built that up to understand the burden of disease on a daily basis. Uh, the fact today is if you look at the numbers first, we had a double digit rise in overdose deaths from 2019 to 2021. Now we're starting to see a flattening um, in the last year. That flattening is important because in any epidemiological curve, uh, as we all know, it, the things change over, they have to sort of, the rate of increase has to go down before you start to see a pure uh, flattening and decline after that. I think we're, that's where we are. And I think also indicates that our policies and, and work seems to be working. Uh, we do have to, in the next year, double down on a few of those things that I highlighted today in order to get even greater benefits in saving lives. Um, I think there's a lot more that can be done through data. I think, look, for every death that happens from overdose, there's a, there's a number of non-fatal overdoses that happen. And that number varies from about being 15 to one to even more or less per state. Um, we don't keep that data very well. We're publishing, uh, in, uh, it's in publication, a manuscript that shows state by state that ratio. Now, years ago, when someone came with a TIA, a transit ischemic attack, we used to send them home, maybe give an aspirin. We recognized that there's a large percent of people will have a full-blown stroke in the next two weeks, and we changed the way we do business when it comes to TIAs. Every non-fatal overdose is a cry for help. We have to stop, in so many ways, uh, the concept of treat and street people, and we really need to look at that as a cry for help and start to do, understand every overdose and make sure that people do not have the second overdose, which might be then fatal. So there's a lot of data that needs to happen behind that to enable first responders, hospital ERs, and others to take the first event of an uh, overdose extremely seriously and prevent that from progressing further and capture and get those people the help they need. Thank you. Let me ask you two more questions from me, then I'll switch to questions from the audience. Um, as you know, our School of Public Health is located right in the Mass Cast area in Boston, which uh, lately has been in the news quite a bit, both locally and uh, nationally, um, because we really are at the epicenter of an area where a lot of people who are struggling with homelessness, substance use disorders um, are living. Can you just uh, talk us through a little bit what role the federal government, ONDCP, plays in helping with challenges like this and how you intersect with state and, of course, municipal governments on it? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the, the dollars we talked about, Congress appropriates the money across various grants and programs, and we oversee the policy and the implementation of those dollars through various agencies. Now, those dollars uh, often will go to the Department of Health in Massachusetts, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Transportation, and others. Our role is to coordinate that work in a way that it could be effective. Um, so when it comes to, uh, you know, particular areas, it becomes very important to take an approach that addresses both the supply side, but also the demand side. We often see like, um, we've seen data in the areas of Chicago where 
the heat maps overlap between uh, gang activity and overdoses. Uh, that allows us to say that we can prevent a number of overdoses by surging naloxone into those areas. That again goes back to understanding the data in, in particular areas and, and, and working to remove whether it's the unhoused population, whether it's the other challenges in treatment to get people that help. Um, so I, I, we work with both um, you know, city mayors as well as governors and administrations across the country uh, and really are there to support any initiatives, plans, but also to share the data in a way that it could be helpful. Um, and um, it, I mean, I'm, I'm very well aware of uh, the mass and cast part um, I have, you know, two children who graduated from Boston, so I understand uh, a lot of that. Uh, I think it's important because these are the challenges that we face in cities all across the nation, um, and that's why a comprehensive approach is so critical. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you, you mentioned children graduating, so let me ask you a question about workforce. Um, uh, you hinted at this in your presentation, but uh, we are um, tremendously under-resourced and from a workforce um, that is able to deal with substance use disorders. Whenever I talk to my colleagues who are running clinical institutions, they're always running dozens and hundreds of people short who are able to uh, uh, provide services. What is, um, what's ONDCP's role? What's ONDCP doing to try to address that? And actually, I'll also flip it around. What should we be doing? And by we, I mean those of us who are in academic public health space to try to address this challenge. So it's a real challenge. And I think one of the things we have to look at is, um, you know, we've, we've expanded the loan repayment programs, the fellowships to HRSA uh, for those providers. But the fact is the challenges are greater than just providers. It's about counsel, uh, counselors, it's about social workers, it's about the entire teams that's going to need. Now, some of that will be helped by, uh, you know, telehealth and other aspects of this. But um, I think Congress and the federal government have to figure out how to uh, expand the workforce piece. That's the first piece. Uh, we're working on something called the cascade of care model right now to understand how can we first of all, get uh, people to have some, some version of a universal screening for addiction and then help them get into as a primary care problem. Uh, I think the schools can do a great bit by introducing consistently addiction curriculum or SUD curriculum into uh, health-related professions because that gets more and more uh, students interested in following career paths that could be not only uh, rewarding wholly, but also important to the workforce of the nation when it comes to behavioral health. Thank you. Let me go to some questions from the audience. We have about 30 questions. Don't worry, we're not going to go through all of them, but I'll try to group some. Um, there's a few questions, um, all um, complimenting you, Dr. Gupta, and ONDCP for the work that you've done to make methadone treatments more available in Black and Brown communities. And then asking the question around stigma, that uh, commenting that um, these methadone treatments have historically been highly stigmatized. And your thoughts and also any actions that are taken can be taken to reduce the issue of stigma for these medications, particularly in communities, minoritized communities? Uh, that's an important question. Uh, that is exactly right. That, you know, in some ways, uh, stigma pre prevails in communities, in families, but also in healthcare, healthcare systems. Um, I think it's going to be important. That's why we're re-looking at the methadone aspect of this. That's why the X waiver removal is important because and part of this is the these are policies, but part of it's also it has um, collateral uh, benefits, which is it helps to mainstream disease and its treatment. Uh, not unlike what we have done with other diseases in the past, whether it's cancer or HIV or others, uh, it is really important um, that we work both uh, the, the healthcare systems when it comes to stigma, uh, education and curricula when it comes to stigma, and then, of course, uh, walking the talk. Uh, you know, one of the things that in the President's budget uh, that is right now in Congress is uh, working to remove the names, uh, stigmatizing names like National, National Institute for Drug Abuse uh, or SAMHSA, um, Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration. So some of those terms we're working also to remove, so that sends this clear signal to us here in the country and outside the country that we really are serious about this. Um, but stigma, uh, make no mistake, is a very deep and actual thing that often ends up in killing people, if not not providing them treatment or preventing them from the provision of the treatment. 
Thank you, Rashid. I just uh, I, I couldn't agree more about language and uh, stigma. And for anybody who's interested in the audience, our um, Professor Rich Sates, who was our late uh, chair of community health sciences, wrote some of the really key papers around stigma, around uh, language, around substance use disorders. Um, let me take another cluster of questions. This one is a harder cluster of questions. And the number of people um, uh, challenge the assumption that uh, disrupting supply chain and reducing supply actually will have much of an impact on uh, substance use and substance use disorder, making the argument, not unreasonable argument, that you block supply chain in one drug and you result in other drugs, potentially things like xylazine that enter the drug supply. I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I've spent a lot of time looking at this and a lot of uh, information and data and perspectives. What it comes down to is that um, people, oftentimes Americans, because this is not uh, always a problem elsewhere, think um, with uh, one pair of glasses only oftentimes. There are people that are all on the supply side or there are those who are exclusively on the demand side. And just like any complex problem, this is one that we should look at it as two sides of the same coin. Not that we need to, you know, as it's been said before, we need to be able to walk and chew gum. We should not um, um, sort, of, sort of put ourselves in a position that if we do that, the other will be defeated. To give you an example, ONDCP's budget used to be 90% supply side and 10% demand side in the past. Today, the president has proposed $46 billion budget. 57% is demand side and uh, the rest of his supply side. So the point is that I think it's important uh, to show money where you're making your investments. A lot of those investments are not going into the public health, the medical, the demand side part of it, which is very important, saves lives. At the same time, we must understand it is not about supply. It's about why this is happening. It's not about a particular drug. It's about why that is happening. And when you cut through all of the um, sort of, you know, products and you understand it's actually a commerce. It's a business. That business will not stop. Um, you have to figure out how to disrupt that business, that commerce, because it's about profits and it's about operating capital. So that's why our, our shift in supply side now has moved and focused more of disrupting the commerce rather than exclusively locking people up. And that's what I think it's really important to understand is uh, the people who have had a sort of a perversion to the supply side, it's because we've had an approach of locking people up for substance use disorder. That is not what we're advocating for. That's a helpful distinction, thank you. A question from Dr. Wally, um, uh, talking about the uh, WHO, UNODC, UNAIDS, uh, uh, methadone treatment goals for more than 50% of people with, with uh, OUD treated with methadone. Most European countries have surpassed this benchmark. We're somewhere in the 11, 25% range. Can you just comment a little bit on why that discrepancy and what you can see us doing to actually get to where many other Western European countries are? So I think we are far behind, and, and I think we're far behind for good reasons. Part of this has been our approach to substance use disorder. Part of it's been our policies towards this issue. Part of it's been, um, you know, the, our healthcare system not being resourced enough to get people the help, and we showed the data for that. What we have to do now is to move forward, and I, that's why I say evidence-based data-driven approach, because if that's where our data is taking us, that we need to get people the help when and where they need it, meaning that if someone at 2 a.m. feels that they need to get into a treatment center and we, they call and we give them an appointment three months later, it doesn't work for that person. That's a harm reduction approach. So we have to find a way to help that person right then there and with those medications that, that they need. Um, we're thinking from that lens moving forward and I think we're going to get, probably end up getting closer, maybe not surpassing the European model, but getting closer than we've been in the past in terms of expanding treatment and getting people real-time help when they need it. Um, as I said, we can't afford not to do that any longer because, as I mentioned some of the stats, we're losing a trillion and a half dollars, the equivalent of Russia's economy, every year. We're losing workforce. We have some of the lowest uh, birth uh, rates in the, on the record. So it's all of these things coming together. When you look at it beyond two or three or four year cycles, 
we have to get treatment to people. We have to develop recovery-friendly workplaces, and we have to support the recovery journey of people through a holistic wraparound service approach. All right, let me uh, shift to another difficult question. I'm trying to balance more straightforward with harder questions. Um, uh, that's a question from uh, Paolo Pinetti um, uh, about where are we at on having a national conversation about legalization and management of the drug market. It's a really difficult issue, I think. And uh, But you know, given the fact that we've talked about harm reduction in this conversation, it seems worth asking, where do you think that conversation is at and where do you think the conversation is headed? So I think, uh, first of all, we're in a, as I mentioned, in a stage where we have so many Americans dying and we know how we can stop. If you just look at the data I provide today, we can save about 46,000 of the 110,000 lives simply by knowing what, what to do and, and doing it. So this is, to me, when it comes to, as a physician, saving lives, this is not about why well, we don't know what to do. We have evidence and data supporting how we could save 30 to 40% of those at least by just two policy changes. So that's the first piece that we've got to understand. We know what works. We have to ensure and implement it with a sense of urgency. Now, I will say that last fall, the president has asked um, Department of Justice and Department of Health and Human Services to use, again, evidence, data, and science to take another look at the scheduling of marijuana um, and provide the, the report back. Uh, the reason, and he's, so he's done that, that's one part. Second, what he did was he's pardoned people with simple possession of marijuana offense in the federal system. And third, he's asked state governors to do the same. Why is that important? Because there's so much disproportionate impact on uh, marginalized communities, uh, communities of color, uh, from simple possession of marijuana charge that prevents those individuals from you know, getting an education loan, housing, so many other things. So we're actually looking at this from, a, once again, an approach that is passionate, it's evidence-driven, but it's one that you know uh, we, we're working with it through science to make best decisions possible. Thank you. Uh, changing track, um, uh, how are people with uh, lived experience of substance use disorders being centered in decision-making process at ONTCP nationally? A sign very significantly. I mean, we have people with lived experiences working in my office for the maybe the first time, uh, we have people with lived experiences working in the White House, per se. Uh, we have regular meetings with stakeholders. Uh, that includes people with lived experiences um, uh, to help us. We've done significant and extensive consultations on the strategy that I, I highlighted with people with lived experiences before we published it. So it's really important to center around that because um, a lot of that in, uh, work we do is informed by folks that have lived experiences because it's so important to do that. Uh, different question, Dr. Rosenblum. Um, uh, we know that buprenorphine in emergency department uh, saves lives. Um, how can the federal government use its leverage to make treatment initiation in the emergency room a standard of care through the country, for example, as a condition of participation in Medicare and Medicaid? Yeah, we would, we would, we would, if there was a way to do this overnight, I would do it. Uh, <laughs> we are, we are working to do everything. We encourage emergency departments. We are working with our leaders who are leading this way in some states. Uh, Massachusetts, of course, is one of those. Uh, and we are doing everything possible to encourage uh, a low threshold induction. Uh, and those who are leading the pack, obviously, we're highlighting their examples. We've also put out a state model law about uh, ED uh, induction uh, so that more and more states can look at that, think about it, and maybe make it part of their policy. Um, uh, as I said before, I think it's life-saving. I think that's the difference between life and death for a lot of people. And know that while 110,000 people die, it's probably at least a couple of million people who go through a non-fatal overdose that come through some of the ED and urgent care that we can capture early and not wait till they have a second, third, or fourth overdose happen again. Let me go to a difficult question again. Um, uh, this is from uh, Joe Kikikio. Um, um, 
there's an underlying assumption in what you in your presentation that those we who have opioid use disorders want treatment, and uh, I think there is increasing evidence that is not always the case. And the Portland experiment certainly probably suggests that very strongly. So, um, how do we deal with that? How do we even think about that? And what measures would one think about to help those who do not necessarily want treatment? Yeah. So uh, let me just expand the lens a little bit. There's literally you can put folks into three categories. Uh, those who are perhaps casual users and they feel that it's not an SUD, but they have things under control. There are those who order online what they think is Xanax or Adderall and, and actually end up overdosing, often sometimes fatally, because it's a, a counterfeit pill. And then there's those who have true SUD, we can all agree with, with the DSM criteria. So now let's move to the ones that have just SUD through the DSM criteria. Um, I think it's important to educate, inform, and engage people with SUD. We would not do this for people with diabetes, people with heart conditions, CAD, or hypertension, right? I mean, I wouldn't be fulfilling my oath if I wasn't engaging my patients with diabetes to uh, every time to encourage them to do what I'm recommending them to do, or same thing with people who are smoke or otherwise. So I, I think it's an important piece of recognition that engagement, whether it's through harm reduction or through peer recovery network or peer support network or otherwise, the engagement is the key here. Um, and, and engagement will yield the outcomes eventually, um, the intended outcomes. So it's not an issue of forcing people into treatment on one hand, but this, at the same time, it's not about meeting people where they are and then leaving them there because that's not uh, neither humane nor a, a something that you know it aligns with a lot of a lot of us who've taken the oath um, uh, to practice good medicine. Thank you. I, I think the the the, um, the shift to engagement, your answer, engagement is really excellent. Thank you. Um, a question from Dr. Pack, um, um, commending you on your focus on justice involved populations and uh, commenting that you know many law enforcement officials are reluctant to make uh, methods available for multiple reasons. What do you think are policy levers to speed the adoption of this, these evidence based practices? So I have to first say that one of the surprising things that often doesn't often doesn't get talked about in the public health community is the shift that is happening in law enforcement to also recognize addiction, SUD as a disease. And law enforcement officers, the ones I've met with, who are tired of incarcerating and people, putting people behind bars for a disease. I think we have to take advantage of that. We have to make sure that the law enforcement community becomes a partner not an adversary in addressing it. So that's the first just commentary I wanted to make. Uh, it's a huge opportunity for public health community to do to be able to make progress here with a, 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 an area which has been tough and difficult over decades. But I will say, uh, when I look at this criminal justice arc, the arc starts really at deflection. Uh, maybe before that, but we put a deflection model state law out. There's about a thousand deflection programs across the United States. What that means is, if there's someone who has SUD or a mental health condition and they are uh, you know, caught for theft or other things, the best, I, the best, best practice is to get them help, uh, whether it's food security, housing, other things, rather than incarcerating. So deflection is, is such an, you know, diversion is such an important piece of uh, just, justice. Second is, of course, um, you know, while in, in custody to get people's treatment and then drug courts and then is a fourth part is at re-entry population that we're making sure that they have the help that they need. Now, policy-wise, what needs to happen is we have about 15 or 16 states that have already applied for the 1115 Medicaid waiver to start Medicaid 90 days before release from jail or prison in the state. Um, two of them have been approved already, California and Washington. Um, it's been both blue states and red states. Um, I would love to see literally all 50 apply. Um, I would love to see get everybody have that ability to get treatment behind the walls because that will be a significant game changer 
uh, for both not only not spending taxpayer dollars in funding prison systems, but also in people becoming much more productive post-release and not be subject to overdose or reincarceration. Thank you. Just a, a note that uh, just last week, uh, Boston University, we hosted the annual meeting of the Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative, PARI, who I know you know well, and uh, several people who actually are on this uh, on this call have been involved in uh, starting PARI. And that group has been doing, in my mind, um, outstanding work in bringing law enforcement um, to engage in uh, dealing productively with the opioid epidemic. So there are groups like that that have really been, um, I think, paving the way for a much more productive way to engage law enforcement. Um, we're almost running out of time, so I'll end with my last question. Um, you know, you're dealing with a uh, an epidemic of uh, certainly of uh, overdose, overdose death, as you've said several times correctly. For every overdose death, there are many other um, overdose injuries, and and some days I feel like the substance use and substance use disorder uh, crisis feels intractable. Um, you deal with this every day. Uh, what what gives you hope? Thank you, Dean. Uh, I just want to mention, uh, first of all, about PARI, that uh, PARI is just a fascinating organization, and, and, and I'm glad that you have, uh, you're partnering and there's people here on there because they are champion, they are foresight uh, folks on that. Um, when it comes to hope, here's why, why, what gives me hope. Um, I've spent a lot of time treating people. I've, seen, I've also been to a lot of funerals of people who didn't make it. Um, I really believe that, you know, behind these numbers are actual people and behind people are families. And now we're coming towards holidays. There are going to be a number of empty chairs around uh, dinner tables, which cannot be and will not be filled because a mom would say to me, only if I knew that naloxone was there, I would have saved my child's um, life. It is so painful for her to say that, and it's so painful for me to hear that. And so what gives me hope is that if there's one more we can prevent, one person we can save, any, every one of us today on call can save one person, that's gonna be hundreds of people. Uh, and that's the hope, the hope of uh, just, you know, uh, prevailing uh, goodness and making sure that we're taking a point of compassion as one of judgment as opposed to, and trying to help a fellow person um, in their time. Uh, I think we can do it. I, I really believe that we can bring these numbers down significantly. I think we can have an impact. And look, if there's more chairs that are filled at the next holiday time around dinner table, um, you know, we like to, we all like to be a small part of that. This is nothing not an issue that only one agency, one person, one institution can do. This is one that is part of the President Biden's unity agenda for a reason, which is all of us have a role to play. And only if all of us work on this issue can be solved. I think there's no better way to end this conversation than on a note of compassion and hope. Um, Dr. Gupta, thank you for everything you do every day. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, participants in this conversation who are uh, engaged or many, many questions in the Q&A, many more I could get to, many interesting comments in the chat. And I know that these uh, conversations draw participants who engage in these issues on a daily uh, basis. And uh, I always feel very strongly that it requires a whole uh, community of um, experts, people with lived experience, people who are interested in the issue to advance us on particularly the hardest issues that we deal with. Um, um, Everybody, thank you once again for being a part of this. Thank you for what you do every day. Everybody take good care. Have a good day.